We are here at Swell 2024 covering the Mer Ripple event. So, Philip, great to meet you. Great to meet you as well. Great to have you on the show. Let's kind of jump into a little bit around the framework of where security begins at Coinbase, because I think a lot of people who think of Coinbase look at it from a retail front, mm -hmm. don't necessarily look at it from maybe a institutional capital side yet, mm -hmm. which is a bigger part of that. Talk to me about the framework that you guys are involved with in terms of building a security system at Coinbase. Sure, so security, obviously critical to what Coinbase does, right? Uh, one of the foundational elements that that you know Coinbase brings to the table is that trust, is that track record, is that ability to protect what was at the time of our last you know, 10Q, $269 billion worth of uh, US dollars worth of assets. Right. Um, and so we spend a lot of time and effort on uh, both building the team that builds security into, the, into our products, mm -hmm. as well as um, you know, focusing on secure design from the very, very beginning. And that's really independent of retail or institutional or anything else. Because when you think about cybersecurity breaches, you know, the, the, the high end stuff, the you know, flashy zero days, whatever, that's, everyone's excited about that and it's really cool when you see it. But the vast majority of breaches happen, you know, day in, day out for very mundane reasons, yeah. right? People don't patch. They fail to write software securely, things like that. So we're very, very focused on doing that consistently over time, every single time. When you look at the horizon, especially at this point where we're getting with things like AI, obviously the integration of a lot more, I think, savvy people around crypto mm -hmm. and blockchain in general. Is there anything you guys are looking at? Yeah, so I think... AI is a fascinating sort of ingredient to add to the mix here. Um, my view of, of AI is it doesn't necessarily make things better, it makes them faster. What does that mean for, for bad guys? Well, that means scammers can, mm -hmm. can be more efficient. I mean, there right. can be more of them out there and they can move A lot more their, creative a lot too. More, a lot more, <laughs> well, you know, I would say actually no, but the average level of creativity increases, yeah. right? You can take someone right off the street, give them an, an AI bot and they'll, look and feel like I'm much more experienced. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Just the same as you would a someone who's who's maybe trying to do trading strategies. So are or you whatever. saying that maybe with AI it's it's uh, easier to detect it? So that's the other side of it as well, right? Is that AI makes things faster, including both the bad guys and the good guys. Okay. Right? And so we we are doing tons of research and looking into how, where and how do we integrate AI mm -hmm. into our ability to detect and respond as well. Talk about um, the side, I mean, we just saw a huge situation with TD Bank, mm -hmm. um, a lot of drug money running through uh, what is traditional fiat. People have pointed, including Senator Warren, at the crypto and blockchain market as being one of the mm -hmm. key contributors to this. What you're saying, though, and what we're finding is that is not necessarily the case, but at Coinbase, it can still be used for that. I mean, if you have somebody that's got... Uh, you know, an LLC in you know South mm -hmm. America for whatever reason, they're setting up shell companies, et cetera, and then hosting funds, whether it's Bitcoin or many other digital assets. How do you guys go about trying to track things like that? Down? Sure. And so what's interesting to me is that, you know, we did an illicit finance report, I think it was a month or two back, published that, published some stats on the amount of illicit finance that we see being used in crypto. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can even get close to that number is a unique characteristic of crypto. If you try to do that for, for the US dollar economy, right, right. As, as many people have, you end up with wildly divergent numbers, primarily because it's so hard to track where this stuff is. What, like, how much illicit finance is there in the US dollars? Mm -hmm. Number one, a lot more than in crypto. Um, but number two, no one knows. I would agree with that. But in the sense of um, the United States, right. most likely we're going to get a stablecoin bill Mm -hmm. which means that we're going to start seeing corporations holding a lot more digital asset potential, mm -hmm. which means that you guys are probably going to end up with a lot more customers mm -hmm. that are now holding things like USDC mm -hmm. and other stable coins here in the U.S. as capital. And that, of course, is going to open people up to security measures. They're going to start asking a lot more questions to guys like you. When you look at major uh, investment platforms, whether it's someone like a BlackRock who's using uh, Coinbase for security, uh, is there things that you guys are doing right now to kind of prepare for that, get ready for those kinds of I mean, the, the fact onslaught. of the matter is, yeah, the fact of the matter is we're already asked these questions, right? Mm -hmm. We already have uh, major institutional clients on the platform. But at scale, you know, right now we're right. dealing with a $2.8 trillion market that sure. could easily balloon up to mm -hmm. maybe $6 trillion in this bull run. That's a lot bigger market yeah. yep. and a lot more digital assets. It is, but the process isn't different. 
right? Same thing. So same, you're ready. Same thing. This is this is executing it more for sure. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually a place where AI can help in a lot of cases, okay. as it turns out, because a lot of the stuff is answering questions that we already know the answer to. Right. Right. And so, how do we do that? How do we do it quickly and efficiently? There, there's a place for AI in that. What are you guys doing to kind of open up that communication line with DC? especially around security, because I think that's the main thing, much like the banks have done. The banks mm -hmm. have been able to do this very effectively with DC. They have. How are you guys doing it? So uh, we're honestly doing a lot of the same thing that the banks have done. We just recently stood up um, what's called a, a, an ISAC, an intelligence sharing um, group that's a public-private partnership specifically for crypto. Okay. Um, so so the, the, the biggest ISAC today is called FS ISAC, Financial Services ISAC, right? It's where all the banks come together and and talk amongst themselves as well as interface with the government on security matters. Um, and, and it's great. We've been members of that for a long time, but the problem is they only let financial institutions into right, that group. Right. So they, they might quibble at Ripple, for example, being added to FSISAC. They mm -hmm. would say, well, you're not really a financial institution. Um, and so we, we set up crypto ISAC so we could bring everyone together in one place and talk with a, you know, with a unified voice in that way. There's also been a bunch of efforts staying with crypto. I'm sure you're, you're, yep. you're deeply aware of come from the industry as a whole. To That's really more speak. of a lobbying platform, mm -hmm. though. Uh, but getting into DC from a sense of, you know, kind of the nuts and bolts of mm -hmm. security. You're, you're saying ISAC is kind of the... ISAC's the way to do it. We also do a bunch of work briefing staff and, and members um, when they ask, when they're interested in, really really telling the message that like, hey, look, this is possible to do safely and securely. Right. Like, and look at us, we've done it before. Are you finding that education pathway open for DC? Because that's one of the things we've talked to several congressmen in the last 30 days here, uh, leading up to uh, possibly a change in an administration. Mm -hmm. Right now we've seen the Biden-Harris administration really hold the line when it comes to digital assets in terms of pressure. Obviously that's supported through Senator Warren. My question is, is what are the, and really Coinbase is one of, if not the mm -hmm. alpha dog in the game here in the US. But to be able to get um, our lawmakers kind of educated, because I've been surprised in interviewing them how yet totally educated they are around mm -hmm. this space. What are you guys doing there? There's, there's, there's obviously a, a, a spectrum of curiosity, curiosity and openness, right, around digital assets. So where we have that curiosity, we like to show up and, and educate, right? We have a whole policy team based in DC right. that does that focuses on this exact thing, it's educating those lawmakers, having the conversations, bringing the experts, whether it be from security or AML or compliance or wherever into the room to help, to help these lawmakers understand what crypto is all about. Are, on the security side, are you guys working any with uh, the base team and what they're doing? Oh yeah, we, okay. we, we, we just spend a ton of time with base and what they're doing. Um, both from a security review perspective, we've spent right. countless, countless hours reviewing that, building tools, absolutely. Is there anything that developers have to go through from a security standpoint to be able to develop on base nope. and address anything? It is open permissionless blockchain, it's L2 obviously. Um, they can they can hop on that and develop whatever they want. Just go. Absolutely. We are, yeah. we are focused on not gatekeeping on yeah. base. Let's talk, let's go a little bit further into retail security, because yeah. this is one I think a lot of, of our viewers are maybe more interested in, because there's a lot of people that are not in institutional capital, they mm -hmm. use Coinbase as their primary you know, um, place for crypto. And if you look at security in general, it has been somewhat solid. Mm -hmm. I will say that you know maybe the biggest snafu was in the last bull run, we saw zero balances come out. Mm -hmm. How would you guys address your learnings from that cycle to where you are now and the prep of what we might see sure. coming and, up? And that was actually, I mean, it obviously caused alarm amongst folks. I got in any number of text messages when that <laughs> happened saying what's going on. Yep. Um, but in reality, that was that was a, uh, a back-end degraded system, right? Yeah. Um, rather than any security issue there. <clears throat> I think we spend- And when you say back-end degraded system, what do you mean by that? It's a database that got overloaded. Okay, so just too much at one time, yep. and it just couldn't respond. And it, and it, it broke in a way that unfortunately showed the number zero right. balances, <laughs> which was not the way we want. Not things, a good, not a good, not the way point. we want things to go. And so yeah. we focused on. There's two things here, right? One is preparing for the inevitable spikes that come mm -hmm. with bull runs, and two is under is realizing that no matter how much you prepare, if if you get, you know, you have to set a target, whatever, however many million users your target is, and as you start to exceed that, right? The systems are going to degrade, so right. they should degrade gracefully. Zero balance should not be a thing. It should it should say 
something yeah. else, right? Just loading, system whatever, available, system, whatever, whatever yeah. right? Um, and and being able to, to do that, to do the testing, um, to get ahead of right. these these spikes and realize that that we're never going to be ahead of every single spike. We can't predict the future here. Sure. So we need to make sure that when those when that things happen, that, that users see. So you're feeling better messages. about this cycle coming yes, up. Yes, I am. Uh, let's talk about customer security because mm -hmm. um, I know you know me myself. I'm a Coinbase user. Most of the people I know and, and have talked to many times are Coinbase users, and privacy and security mm -hmm. of our data yep. uh, and our information very paramount in terms of uh, top on the list. Uh, most people in crypto somewhat uh, paranoid, I would say, mm -hmm. to, rightly so. How are you guys dealing with that? Because that obviously is going to open up a can of worms as we start to see regulatory framework enacted here in the United States. How will Coinbase protect um, customers' information? Yeah, and I think there's, there's a, there's a, there's, that's probably a half hour conversation right there. Well, let's but hit the top. Let's, 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 let's hit the top of that, which is that the same way we always have, first of all, is the answer. Um, regulatory frameworks are important, they're critical, because they create consistency in how mm -hmm. things are treated. But reg regulatory frameworks don't you know, generally make good security, they make, a, they make a floor, is how we look at it, right? Um, and so, the things that we've been doing to protect uh, uh, consumer assets, consumer information, by the way, my information, my assets too, I keep all right. of my assets on Coinbase, um, is the same things we're going to be doing tomorrow when that regulatory framework drops. Maybe mm -hmm. just tweak things to align better with, you know, the words in the in the in the regulations, both here and internationally, right? The, with Mika and Dora in the EU, mm -hmm. similar such similar situation. Two is we have um, uh, so that's like protecting from from bad guys, right? How about protecting from oversharing with with governments, right? We yeah. have a long track record of challenging overbroad. Um, uh, uh, requests for data. I, right. I don't know if you remember back in 2017, we were in court with the IRS um, over a very broad information sharing request that we got. Yeah, them. they were looking for pretty much a full mm -hmm. rundown of all users and activity there uh, within that. Do you feel that that pressure is going to continue from government agencies in the future and how are you guys prepared for it? You know, I think as with any financial financial institution, there's a balance of, of satisfying a government's legitimate need for mm -hmm. information, for law enforcement purposes, things like that. Um, and we've we we make no bones about the fact that, that we will absolutely we we respond to warrants and subpoenas and government requests for data sure. that are reasonable in size and scope yeah. and purpose, right? No problem. Um, but when we will push back when that scope is overbroad or is um, what we believe to be you know untargeted or more of a dragnet. Interesting. Okay, so with with that being the case, because I think that that's a, a scenario that a lot of people are more worried about. That of course brings up DeFi, mm -hmm. Coinbase Wallet, one of the best wallets out there for DeFi and in general, and also I think competitive in the space of where uh, decentralized finance is going. Mm -hmm. As you see more users starting to offboard assets mm -hmm. into DeFi, what is Coinbase doing to kind of bridge that process from a security standpoint. Coin, you know, the wallet itself is pretty right. significant. We'd have the wallet team on here before. Uh, they've been very you know, forthcoming in how they're building. What are you guys seeing from a security standpoint in terms of any issues? You know what's interesting is that um, uh, you know, the rallying cry for a long time has been sort of be your own bank, right? Yeah. With, yeah. Uh, with, this, with, with DeFi and with wallets and, and like, I'm all for that, right? But you then have to be your own bank. And that, with, with, with all of the, where your backup stored, how do you protect right. your seed yep. phrases, what happens if your house burns down, is the, does that backup in your mom's basement, is it, is it still viable, is it there, did she throw it out, right? Like, all of these things start to become top of mind issues that from a, from a, from a custodial standpoint, we right. take care of, right? Yep. We, we handle all of that. And so it's a very different threat model for people. And that's the biggest thing I think people, people need to help themselves understand is they need to now think about they're protecting whatever it is, a million dollars of, mm -hmm. of USDC. Um, that's a quite significant amount. Well, it's a different, it definitely is a different security layer because yeah. it's it's something that most consumers, especially retail, they've never been um, exposed to that Correct. kind of, of exposure in general. And especially from a standpoint of having to deal, deal with seed phrases and the technology behind blockchain. With that being the case, do you feel that Coinbase is in a position to do things like recovery efforts? Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's easy on the exchange, you know, mm -hmm. fairly uh, simple to a certain extent. 
But when people are moving in and out of DeFi, mm -hmm. which is, is pretty uh, frequent right now, a lot of people assets moving off, we're going to see an onslaught of assets moving on mm -hmm. for transactions, et cetera. That process and the security for that, any potential products or services that Coinbase might offer in the future to help kind of aid that. Uh, I, I hate to get into future products because they don't exist yet. Um, but I think uh, stepping back and answering more broadly, I think that you know we've done some work in, in Wallet on things like transaction transparency mm -hmm. and helping people understand exactly what the transaction they're signing is going to do. That's very important, right? Because some of these transactions get very complicated, um, and uh, around um, you know education for people as they're as they're touching seed phrases, things like yeah. that, right? Yeah. Very very important as well. Well, and you've got so much activity happening in the swap space mm -hmm. within the DeFi scenarios, and that it starts to change things up because an asset leaves an exchange, goes mm -hmm. into a, a DeFi wallet, yep. ends up being swapped four or five times for you know token to token, platform to platform, may make it back into an exchange mm -hmm. completely different as an asset. Yep. Being able to track that, I know Coinbase does some things from a tax standpoint, mm -hmm. I won't get into all that, but from your services side, but the security side of it is still a very, you know, it's, it's, big it's fascinating. Scenario. It requires a lot of education. I think the other the other piece here is the, is the the smart wallets are mm -hmm. going to be a fascinating piece here as well, as we see more consumers adopt those. I think the capabilities that those bring on chain are, are fascinating. That's probably the one thing that I've seen come out of Coinbase in the last twelve months that I felt is this is a huge leap forward, especially mm -hmm. for the onboarding of so many new people into yeah. crypto. It makes in it much much easier for sure. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the future a little bit and kind of where you see from a regulatory standpoint, let's say we have a perfect um, storm here mm -hmm. and we get a favorable administration in the White House. Mm -hmm. We possibly get a stable coin bill going mm -hmm. through uh, Senate. And then of course we start to see uh, a lot more adoption, you mm -hmm. know, because those are the three yep. key things that really need to happen. What would that mean for the industry? Do you feel like you know, from not only from a security standpoint, but just a growth standpoint? I mean, it's going to be a fascinating situation. I think you were you hit it on the head that we're going to see more people, more institutions in the space. Yeah, it's obviously in, the, the, the the commensurate increases in volume. Um, I think with more people in the space from a security perspective, I always think about education. How do we how do we bring them into crypto in a way that's a positive first experience? where they understand what, what, what the security concerns in this space are and can posture themselves effectively and appropriately. Um, I talk a lot about, about um, that sort of consumer protection angle as, you know, we all learned some basic skills growing up uh, over the kitchen table, right? Uh, don't don't uh, uh, turn your mail off when you go on vacation, things yeah. like that, right? None of us learned those things about cybersecurity, yeah. right? So, so that's the primary thing that comes to me is with more adoption, with more volume, with more people, there's more education. There's, uh, there's, uh, uh, I think, a real focus for us on making sure those people come into this space safely yeah. um, and, and learn what they need to learn. Well, in the, the amount of phishing scams that we're mm -hmm. seeing in crypto right now, I would say dwarf that in most of the traditional fiat systems for you know several reasons. Obviously, the access to what we might see in the DeFi side of things, a lot of things mm -hmm. that, that move quicker, obviously, with crypto and are difficult to do forensic analysis. It takes quite a bit of work mm -hmm. to be able to do that, but it is happening. Do you guys have a forensic analysis team when you're trying to track bad actors? So you mean in terms of, in terms of blockchain? Yes. Um, so we do we do a lot of work with uh, blockchain tracking of, of bad assets for, for two reasons. Number one, so that we can better find the patterns in what they're doing and we can prevent bad things from happening in okay. some cases. Um, and two is so that we can um, help track these actors, uh, and and to the extent we can group at, we can group activity together and and, and you know give law enforcement a, a, a head start yeah. on tracking these folks. We, without, we do so without going into kind of the secret sauce, but yeah. a lot of the AML regulatory alignment for banks are fairly well known. I think mm -hmm. when people go in and try to do something over a ten thousand dollar transaction certain kinds of transactions that come in that do a quick turnaround, those kind of things, mm -hmm. the traditional things that are easy to track. Crypto is quite a bit different because you can push to, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum into an exchange, make a couple of trades within that, and then do a quick flip out. Is there anything within the Coinbase system from a security standpoint that's flagging those kinds of activities? Oh, sure. 
We have, ha I mean, how do you have, go about it? Sure, we have all the same AML requirements that a bank does, right? Based on how money transmitter licenses mm -hmm. in, in, in every state that, that, that uh, requires them. Um, and so we do that, all that same kind of suspicious transaction review and monitoring. Um, I've never seen a suspicious review. I guess you're just not suspicious. Yeah, like, I feel like I should be because I'm always <laughs> doing things crazy that is within there. But uh, what would be the threshold? Is it monetary value or is it just? I mean, I don't, don't want to get into too much to the, the specific, Give away the sauce. The, the specific <laughs> like you know components there that, um, but but um, I guess you're just not suspicious enough. There all go. I can tell well, you. They we're not suspicious. Be, you you got to be more suspicious <laughs> before. Unfortunately, that's not our that's not our game. But <laughs> but that's a good one. All right, last question to you, and that is, if you had one consideration right now in this next bull run that your most or biggest concern, mm -hmm. what what would it be? It, it's the same concern I have every bull run is that as people get into crypto, they do so uh, with the right amount of education, uh, with the right amount of of uh, of of, uh, for lack of a better word, of respect for the space yeah. and how it is different. Yeah. And do you think is this will be the cycle that will get to a point where almost everybody is somewhat more savvy oh around this? You know, the thing I've learned after eight and a half years in crypto at Coinbase is um, I can't predict anything with regard to this market. So I hope so. That yeah. would be that would be lovely. But well, you know, I think I just, they're, they're, I just don't make bets anymore about. There's been stuff. a lot, a lot of I think in the media, a lot of scare. Mm -hmm. So I think people when they come into crypto, it almost, almost every person that I talk to that's brand new to crypto, first thing they always ask me is security questions. You know, mm -hmm. how secure is it? If I go on Coinbase, is that like a bank? You know, should I be on and off between my bank and and you know? And I said, well, it depends on where you're comfortable. Yeah, right. You know, if you're comfortable banking versus Coinbase. Uh, but if you're comfortable on Coinbase, then it's a great system to, to kind of go on that. So mm -hmm. anyway, very good stuff. Philip Martin, great to have you on great the show. Thanks for coming in today. We appreciate Happy it. To, happy to do it. Yep. All right, you guys, we're going to be covering more here from Swell. We've got a couple more uh, interviews covering a handful of speakers, but we'll also give you guys some of the announcements that are happening. So stay tuned right here on the show. We'll catch you soon.